Very few partnerships in this life last. But today you will hear about a partnership that will never fail and you can be a partner. The investment is small, but the rewards are high. Francois, please tell us about the biblical partnership. How would you like to go into partnership with the wealthiest person on the planet? Someone who owns all the fruitful agricultural land in this world. How would you like to go into partnership with the kindest billionaire in the world? Someone who owns everything good and desirable. In today's lecture, I bring you the good news that God invites poor paupers like you and me to enter into partnership with Him. But before we enter into this partnership with Him, we first have to study His financial statements and His balance sheet. What are His assets? Psalms 24 verse 1 says that the earth belongs to God. He is the owner of this huge planet that orbits in His mighty universe. What about the fixtures? Psalms 24.1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. All the movables and immovables on our planet belong to our Creator. What else belongs to Him? Psalms 24.1, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Did you get the message? You and I also belong to him. He owns the world and all of its inhabitants. We will come back to this tremendous thought in a little while. When you're high up in the air, you get an idea of the vastness of our planet. Someone wrote these beautiful words. This is my father's world and to my listening ears. All nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world, I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, his hand the wonders wrought. When I stood here on Matterhorn in Switzerland, I felt so close to the Creator. He placed all this snow on the Alps to tell me how great his forgiving grace is. Tons of snow to convince me that he can cleanse me from my sins and make me as white as snow. During my visit to the Alps, my thoughts went out to some of the most beautiful verses of Scripture. Listen to the message of Psalms 50 verses 10 and 11. For every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the creatures of the field are mine. Every creature on this planet belongs to him. We catch squirrels and place birds in cages and think we are the owners. God says they all belong to him. When I visited the big hole in Kimberley, I read these amazing facts. When work on the diamond mine ceased in August 1914, they mined 14,504,566 and three quarters carats of diamonds, an equivalent of three tons. Millions of people all over the world wear their diamond rings thinking they belong to them. God says he is the only rightful owner. This Kimberley hole is the biggest in the world, so symbolic of our emptiness without God's blessing in our lives. We own nothing. He owns everything. I wish I knew how many tons of gold were mined in Johannesburg and the reef. Maybe you have some of it in your teeth, on your watch, or around your neck. Haggai 2 verse 8 says, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. On the 27th of January 1966, a little premature baby girl came to live with two people who were praying for her arrival for nine years. I still remember her first birthday party. Her mother teased the little hair she had on her head and invited a few little friends. And as she grew older and older, I loved her more and more. She was mine, so I thought, until I read the following words in Psalms 100 verse 3. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us, 
and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And in Isaiah 43 verse 1, the Lord says, I have redeemed you, you are mine. She is not the owner of this wheelbarrow with the two stones in it, and I'm not the owner of this little girl. God is. He has lent it to me for a short while, and one day I will have to give an account of how I treated God's property. Unfortunately, we bring up our children with a concept that they are owners instead of the concept that they are stewards. And when they grow old, they want to possess their partners. There are many men today who think that they possess their wives and they treat them as their property instead of God's property. May God help us to respect one another's individuality as well as the fact that God, and not we, is the owner of human lives. The concept of stewardship will help us tremendously in our relationships with one another and in coping with loss. Let us examine the four reasons why God claims ownership of everything. And as we study this, he will become more precious to us. Exodus 20 verse 11 says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. His claim as owner is based on the fact that he created everything we see around us. The very first verse in the Bible says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1 verse 1. He first created matter and then he fashioned the rest of creation. Isaiah 45 verse 18 For this is what the Lord says, He who created the heavens, he is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, he founded it. He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. He says, I am the Lord and there is no other. One of the reasons why God instituted the Sabbath is to remind us that He is the Creator. He is the rightful owner of everything we call our own. The second reason why God claims ownership is because He upholds and sustains all things. Hebrews 1, 3 says that God is sustaining all things by His powerful word. It is one thing to create, but it is something else to maintain or sustain what you've made. When you look at the universe through a telescope, you discover God's marvelous sustaining power. Let's read a few verses of scripture that tell us more about it. Hebrews 11.3 By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Job 26 verse 7 He suspends the earth over nothing. Hebrews 1 verse 3 says God is sustaining all things by his powerful word. Acts 17.28 For in him we live and move and have our being. If God should withhold his sustaining power for just one second, our entire universe would collapse. He is the owner because he is also the sustainer. Don't you think this is beautiful? God loves beauty. And in spite of the fact that sin marred this planet, God still left us with beauty to enjoy. What a great sustainer. The next reason why God can claim ownership is the fact that he purchased back what we've lost through sin. 1 Corinthians 6 and 19 Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. Verse 20 You were bought at a price. Therefore honor God with your body. It is far more difficult to recreate than to create. We are God's property twice over, first by creation and then by recreation. David writes in Psalms 111 verse 4, He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. This verse is a reference to the Sabbath. God has designed the Sabbath to be a continual reminder that he is the creator as well as the recreator. In Luke 19 verse 10 we read, 
For the Son of Man is come to seek and save that which was lost. Can you see how we belong to him in a very special sense? John 15, 13 Greater love has no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friend. Isaiah 43, verse 1 I've redeemed you, I've called you by name, you are mine. I looked at the beautiful valleys and mountains in Switzerland and I thanked God for his salvation. I belong to him because of a price that has been paid for me. Another reason why God is the rightful owner of everything I have is because he has given me the power to earn wealth. I don't know how much you possess, but whatever you have belongs to God because he has given you the ability to work and to earn. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verses 17 and 18 You may say to yourself, My power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth, and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your forefathers as it is today. A builder with talents built these beautiful, attractive flats in Holland and sold them at a very good profit. Not a single brick belongs to him or the new owners. Everything belongs to God who made the construction of this building possible. When my child was small, she thought that everything she picked up belonged to her. Just look at the sticks and wire and rubbish. But I taught her that she was only a steward and that everything belonged to God. It relaxes you if you hand over your property with all its worries to the rightful owner. There are many different definitions as to what stewardship means, but I like this one best. It says the wise and unselfish use of life. This man was born in 1761 and he died in 1836. Has he made a wise and unselfish use of life? Am I making a wise and unselfish use of my life? Just remember, life will soon end for you and me. Let us look at stewardship concerning life. Acts 17.28 says, For in him we live and move and have our being. Every second is a precious gift from God, and I'm only the manager of his time. And then we have the stewardship of our bodies. Romans 12 verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Whenever I sit down to eat, I will remember that my body belongs to God. He expects me to look after his precious, valuable property. And when the food is very tempting, Matthew 16, 24, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I will not smoke like this man on the donkey cart because it damages God's property, my body. That's poor stewardship. Stewardship of time is the next one. Moses wrote in Psalms 90 verse 12, So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. This is my late father sitting next to his grandfather's tomb. He taught me to value time. Every second is a precious gift from God and we should use it wisely and unselfishly. Then we come to the stewardship of abilities. Paul says in Philippians 4.13, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Let's use our talents and abilities to serve others. God has given you as an individual something special, unique, that no one else on this planet received. Have you discovered what that special gift is? If you have, please regard it as God's property and use it wisely and unselfishly. And then we have stewardship of material possessions. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 20 and 21, Lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. 
If you are a good steward of time and ability, God will bless you materially. These blessings are the natural fruit of a life of principle and industry. The next question we must ask from God pertains to our relationship to our earthly possessions. How must I handle my money? The first reply is found in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 2. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. The very first requirement is faithfulness. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. Matthew 25 verse 14. This verse emphasizes the fact that I'm only a manager of the possessions God lent me. And of course, if I'm a manager, I will be held accountable. Matthew 25 19. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. Whenever we use the time or money God lent us, let us remember that we will have to give an account one day. How much does God expect me to give? Well, when it comes to time, he says one-seventh. But what about my material blessings? Let's go back in time and ask the Bible to tell us more about our financial obligations to God. This is an ancient well that archaeologists discovered at Beersheba, where Abram lived. In Genesis 14, 18 to 20, I read the following about him. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Abram did not give his tithes to a welfare organization, but to a servant of the gospel, Melchizedek, the king of Salem. Did the principle of tithing change when God introduced the Levitical priesthood? No. God's principles are eternal. If tithing were designed exclusively for supporting the priesthood or clergy, it would remain that way. Numbers 18.21 I give to the Levites all the tithes in Israel as their inheritance in return for the work they do while serving at the tent of meeting. Leviticus 27.30 A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Certain things belong exclusively to the Lord, like a tenth of our income. And this is how Jacob saw it, as we read in Genesis 28 verse 22. Of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. But first of all, the Lord has got to give us something before we can return a tenth to him. How do God's stewards fill his earthly storehouse? I like the way God operates because it brings a tremendous blessing to us when we follow his plan. Malachi 3.10 Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Luke 6 verse 38 says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. God really doesn't need your money. The reason why he introduced this marvelous system of tithing is to teach us to be unselfish, to trust him more fully, and to receive one of the greatest blessings of life. People say that the Sabbath has been done away with, that the health laws have been done away with, and that the principle of tithing has also been done away with. Let's ask Paul to give us his inspired counsel. 1 Corinthians 9.14 In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. The salary of ministers should not be paid from the proceeds of bazaars and fates, but from the tithes of the parishioners. Let's ask Jesus to tell us what he thinks of the tithing system which he introduced so long ago. He comes up 
with a very good explanation in Matthew 23 verse 23 while addressing the Pharisees. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill and cumin. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. The latter refers to what? It refers to tithing. The former refers to what? It refers to justice and mercy toward people. In other words, Jesus taught the principle of tithing, but also the principle of offering. In other words, helping people in need. Before looking into the aspect of offering, let's ask the question, what is the Christian stewardship's first responsibility? What must I do when I receive my salary? Psalms 116 verse 12 What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? The answer is found in Proverbs 3 9 Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. And then Jesus says in Matthew 6 33 But seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. You know, at times my wicked heart becomes extremely selfish. I tend to think only of my own needs. But then a text like John 15, 13 comes to my mind. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. On Calvary, my friend, Jesus, laid down his life for me, and he calls me his friend. Tithing helps me express my appreciation for his love. If tithes are exclusively to be used for the support of the ministry, how are we to build churches and support the poor? The Bible has another solution for this problem. Tithes are not all that you and I are to give. You see, when I've given God's tithes, I've only returned to him what belongs to him. Only when I start giving from the nine-tenths that are left am I really beginning to give to God. Malachi 3 verses 8 and 9 Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. God specifies exactly what our tithes should be. But what about our offerings? Does he give us a clue of what he expects from us? 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verses 1 and 2 Now about the collection for God's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collection will have to be made. The Sabbath is too sacred to work out how God has prospered us financially. This work should be done on a Sunday. Work out your budget and decide on what kind of amount you want to make. It should not be an impulsive giving, but a planned, systematic giving. And once you do it, you will discover the truth of Acts 20 verse 35 where it says, It is more blessed to give than to receive. In Luke 6, 38 we read, Give, and it shall be given unto you. You can only give what God has already given you. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7 that God loves a cheerful giver. Many years ago I bought myself a brand new beetle. I paid a little extra for the green metallic. And then one morning when I woke up, the beetle was gone. Someone stole it during the night. After many months, they arrested the robber, and to my surprise, the criminal was a policeman who should have known better. God regards the withholding of tithes and offerings in a very serious light. It is terrible when we rob ordinary human beings, but it is a very serious crime when we rob him. There was a time when I thought I was doing the Lord a favor by returning his tithes and my offerings. How stupid we are. 
And then I read the following statement and it changed my selfish attitude completely. The Lord does not need our offerings. We cannot enrich him by our gifts, says the psalmist. All things come from thee and from thine own we have given thee. Yet God permits us to show our appreciation of his mercies by self-sacrificing efforts to extend the same to others. This is the only way in which it is possible for us to manifest our gratitude and love to God. He has provided no other. This comes from the book Councils on Stewardship, page 18. You are personally invited by God to come and enjoy the tremendous blessings of giving. I can testify that I've proved God in this matter of stewardship and he has richly blessed me. Please don't miss out on this blessing. And remember, what I spent, I had. What I saved, I lost. And what I gave, I have. Thank you, Francois. The challenge of Malachi 3 verse 10 also comes to you. Test me, says the Lord. I've also personally tested the Lord and reaped the benefit. The reward exceeds the sacrifice by far. Let's close our eyes as we pray. Our Father in heaven, you have given so much to save us. Yes, you have sacrificed your son Jesus Christ. We are deeply indebted to you. Make us faithful in all things, also in your tithes that belong to you. In Jesus' name. Amen.